Hello everyone, today we're going to be doing On the Various Kinds of Distinctions by Francisco Suarez. This is a section of his treatise on unity because distinction is the correlate of unity. Wherever a kind of unity is lacking, a kind of distinction is there to be found. Part 1. Whether besides a real and a mental distinction, there is some other kind of distinction in things. First, the real distinction. The existence and nature of the real distinction. This is just between any two things. Uh, these will always form parts if they're composed together. If you find them in the same thing, they'll both be parts of that thing rather than simply aspects or ideas about the thing. Um, then there are more and less obvious real distinctions. This is like the distinction between Bob and Jim, the distinction between Bob and his torso, and the distinction between Bob's form and Bob's matter. There are multiple kinds of real distinctions. Uh, some of them are positive and some of them are negative. Uh, distinctions that are positive, real distinctions that are positive, are between two positive things, like the distinction between Bob's torso and Bob's head, or the distinction between Bob's form and Bob's matter. Then there's the negative distinction, which is between a positive and a negative, or between two negatives, like a distinction between Bob's blindness and Bob's skull, or between Bob's lack of a leg, which should be there, and Bob's torso. Then we have the mental distinction. The mental distinction has identical reference, so they talk about the same thing, but they have different ideas. There are two kinds of mental distinction. One has no foundation in reality. This is called the distinction of reasoning reason, or rationis ratiocinantis. I got it that time. Uh, between the idea of Peter as subject and Peter as direct object of a sentence. These are simply different ideas we have about an object. They don't have any corresponding distinction in the object itself. Then we have the foundation in reality. Uh, this, is a dis uh, this distinction is called the distinction of reasoned reason. Uh, it happens prior to the action of the mind, at least usually, and it uh, is very often identified with the virtual distinction, which is the distinction between eminent objects. Eminent objects are different things that are capable of being caused by a certain substance. So if you're able to act in a certain way, then you have the distinction between your different powers to act in those different ways. So that's what the foundation is in reality. It's not that they are distinct objects, it's that they're distinct things or distinct powers the object has that it's capable of causing. There are intrinsic and extrinsic mental distinctions. The first kind is intrinsic, this is between Peter as subject and object, which will map on to the purely uh, rational distinction with no foundation in the object, then there's the extrinsic mental distinction, which is the relationship between humanity and humans, or between equine nature and horses. Now, these, if they were real objects, would be really distinct, but because they're impossible objects, they're not real, and not only are they not real, but they're not possible, these are going to be a kind of mental distinction. Um, okay, the origin of the mental distinction. Uh, the mental distinction does not exist without a mind knowing it, uh, and it results from imperfect concepts in the mind. Uh, God does not have any kind of mental distinctions because God knows everything perfectly, but humans know things imperfectly, and as a result, they have different ideas about things. Um, which imperfectly map on to the objects they represent. Now we have a clarification of the original question. Uh, the original question was whether besides the real distinction and the mental distinction there is some third category. Well, assuming that real means prior to the action of the mind and mental means after the action of the mind, then there can't be any third category, but the real question here is whether there's a major and a minor real distinction between two entities, um, and that's how Suarez clarifies the question. First, opinion one. This is just no. All distinctions are either real or mental. Uh, you can't come up with a third category. Those are a disjunction of all distinctions in reality.
Next, we have the argument from the other and the same. Everything is either other from another thing or the same as another thing. There's no in-between between being the same or being other. This kind of maps onto the distinction between univocal and equivocal predicates. If there were many inferior predicates, the superior must be multiplied as well. This is to say that if there were many essences in a thing, then there would be many beings and they wouldn't be in the same thing. So being is the superior predicate and the inferior predicate is whatever the essence is, so say humanity. Uh, if there were multiple humanities, there must be multiple beings there. There can't be multiple inferior predicates without multiple su superior predicates. Next, we have opinion one continued. Whatever exists in reality has its own essence. One thing cannot simultaneously possess two real essences. Therefore, one thing cannot possess two essences in reality. Just another simple argument that there can't be any distinctions prior to the action of the mind in the thing. Then we have the Scotist opinion. This is that there is a distinction prior to the action of the mind in the thing that does not form any kind of composition. The argument for this is that we have distinct pieces of knowledge about the single essences which we know exist as simple and unified, and as a result of that we have knowledge that there is some kind of distinction here and our distinction has to map onto something real in the world because it's knowledge of the essence not simply knowledge of ideas um, okay now we have the refutation of the scotus position suarez says that the scotus position begs the question or refers to things that are only virtually distinct so either they're assuming the conclusion in one of the premises or they are only talking about things which are distinct eminently, things which are distinct and able to be caused by the same object. So they will have a identical foundation, but they'll have different objects of knowledge because they're different things that can be caused by the object. Then Suarez lists three examples of things which he thinks are counterexamples to the idea that different aspects of an essence or different essences need to be distinct prior to the action of the mind in a single being. And that's that uh, the idea of, the, of being itself, the notion of being, doesn't require this kind of distinction. The distinction between species and genus does not require this kind of distinction. And the distinction between the individual difference, or what Scotists would call the hecheity, and the universal don't require this kind of distinction. On the last subject, you can watch the series I did on Suarez's view of individuation if you're more interested in that subject. Then we have Suarez's solution to the question, which is that there is a distinction to be found which is not a real distinction and not a mental distinction, and this is something he calls a modal distinction. The modal distinction is the distinction between an essence and its mode. Uh, this would be between a certain amount of quantity and the thing it inheres in, uh, or its property of inherence, uh, or the way light depends on the sun. Another example, which is maybe a little bit easier to understand, would be the temperature of an object. The temperature is just the vibrational speed the object is at. So the object has entity, and the temperature is something that's true about the object, but the temperature doesn't have its own being. The temperature ha is like this derivative property of the entity in question. This is a distinction which is not between two entities. Uh, it's between an entity and the mode that the entity exists in. So again, think of the, of the vibrational speed. Uh, a cup of coffee does not have to be the specific temperature it is. It doesn't have to be vibrating at that speed. However, it is. Uh, the speed would be the mode, and the entity would be the coffee itself on this view. Why modes are only modally distinct from a thing? Well, we have a priori knowledge of things that are composite, limited, and mutable. Something must account for this, and dependence is not an object. Things like dependence, things like vibrational speed, 
uh, are not objects in the world, they're aspects or they're modes of things which exist. Uh, modes are not things in themselves, but they're dependent upon the essences they inhabit. After this, Suarez goes on to treat a couple different aspects of parts and wholes, which will be interesting for anyone into muriology. Uh, one is the idea of potential parts. So form and matter always make up partial beings, at least in beings that are essentially composed of form and matter. Uh, they are always present and they're always actual parts. But then you have these different physical parts, which are complete beings in themselves. Take, for example, the water molecule, which is present in your stomach or in your bloodstream or something to that effect. Uh, the water molecule is not necessarily tied to you. It's a complete being in itself. But while it's part of a composite, while it's part of the object, it is only potentially a water molecule, whereas actually, it is part of you, and for the moment, it's an incomplete being because it is restricted to being an aspect of you or a part of you instead of being a full thing in itself. Then we have some responses to objections that were leveled against the idea that there is this intermediate distinction between a real and a mental distinction. Uh, the first response is against the argument which says things are either the same or other, there can be no in-between. And the answer from Suarez is that things can be the same in one respect and different in another respect. Uh, and in that way, you can have an in-between. This would correspond to analogy of proportionality or analogy of inequality, which are both kinds of a mix of univocity and equivocity. Then the second argument is from the idea that inferior predicates necessarily multiply a superior predicate. So you have being and then being is modified into finite being, uh, which is modified into human or something to that, uh, to that nature. Uh, and Suarez says the reason that modes don't multiply being is because modes aren't strictly beings, they are a way a being happens to be existing. Okay, now we go to part two. The signs or norms for discerning various grades of distinctions in things. This is going to cover how we know which distinction is taking place in the objects that we're talking about. So the problem here is distinguishing instances of the three types of distinction, real, mental, and modal. Specifically, this is about distinguishing the modal distinction from the other two, because the modal distinction is the most subtle and the hardest to see. Uh, first, the sign of an actual or real distinction in the real order. This is separability and independent existence. Because they are between two substances or two complete beings, a real distinction obtains between objects which are capable of independent existence. If both exist after separation, then it is not a modal distinction. If only one is capable of existing after the distinction, then the distinction is at least modal. There is an objection. Animal is separable uh, from man, but you have said that animal is not really distinct from man. Uh, this is to say that there are animals which exist which are not men, but animal is not really distinct from man, so animal must be separable from man, but is not distinct. Uh, Suarez's response is that only our ideas of animality are distinct. Uh, and we have the same idea of animal that we apply to humans, that we apply to chimps and lions. And as a result of this, there's only a universal idea, but there isn't an actual separability in reality. Then there's the sign of a purely modal distinction. The possible persistence of only one of the two extremes in a distinction will constitute a modal distinction because one aspect or one extreme as Suarez calls them of the distinction is a real entity and the other one is just the mode of the entity. The coffee could have a different vibrational speed and as a result have a different temperature. Uh, the importance of this is that the vibrational speed can't exist without the coffee, but the coffee can exist at any of the different speeds. Uh, 
One of the two of them has its own proper entity. That's what this would show. Next, we have an aside on God's power. Now, because all of the different things which constitute a real distinction are going to be some kind of positive thing that is an actual entity, uh, Suarez is going to want to say that while they may naturally depend on each other, God is capable of sustaining them in existence without the other objects being present. So some things that naturally depend on substance or on a substance or on other accidents are capable of being sustained by God. If they are incapable of sustenance by God, then they are likely only modes. If something can't exist without its corresponding extreme, even with God trying his best to keep it in existence, then it is certainly a mode, or almost certainly a mode. Then we go on to some other signs of a real distinction. One is that the two objects have distinct existences or entities. Uh, this would just be to say that if two things have separate existences, they're probably really distinct. The problem with this is that while this is true, the way you would know your epistemology of whether they have distinct existences or distinct entities is going to be by some kind of separability. So this is going to be a useless sign. Another one is that there's a causal relationship between the extremes. One is caused by the other. Now, this is an interesting one, and it entails at least some kind of modal distinction, because the two objects which are distinct can't stand in causal relations if they're not real things, at least modes. Then we have God's power. Again, God is capable of sustaining uh, or independently creating any two really distinct entities. If one is destroyed, the other can persist. And then he gives a series of exceptions. One is the persons of the Trinity who are really distinct but also incapable of independent existence as each aspects or persons of a necessary nature. Then there's the relationship between a relation and its term. The relation and the term exist but they can't exist uh, but the relation can't exist without the term. And then there's the relationship between God and creatures. If creatures are destroyed, God can keep existing, but if God is destroyed or counterfactually didn't exist, then creatures could not keep existing. Then we have two signs of the mental distinction. If it is a distinction of reasoning reason, the first one, uh, the sign of this is that there's no difference in the content of the concepts. Uh, this will just be Adam is husband of Eve, or Adam is father of Cain and Abel, or Adam is subject or predicate. Adam, the idea is the same, it's relations extrinsic to him which are different. And then there is reasoned reason. This is the difference in the content, uh, this will have difference in the content of the concepts applied to Adam. So Adam is corporal, or Adam is rational. And that'll cover everything in the second section of Suarez's treatise. Then we come to the third and final section, uh, part three, the comparison of the same and other, both with each other and with being. Um, so there are two senses of the word the same. One is relative, one is negative. The relative involves a relation uh, to another. So when you say this is the same as that, you say that there is some kind of sameness uh, between them. Think of two humans. They are the same in that they are both human. This is different from unity because it involves a relation, whereas unity only involves affirmation of uh, sameness in itself. And then there's negatively, which is indivision with itself. Something which is negatively the same is just itself. It's not a different thing from itself. So when you say Bob is the same as Bob, you're just saying Bob is Bob. But this is also different from unity because unity implies indivision in itself, not simply from itself. So something which is the same as itself is just the same set of objects. But something which is united is going to be simple or lack some kind of composition or difference in itself. Next, we have the distinction between difference and otherness. This is going to be very useful in reading scholastic texts and also in reading Aristotle. Uh, 
because uh, these are technical terms which will be employed. Difference is when two things differ, like there's something other or different about them, but then there's another aspect of them which is the same. Whereas objects are totally other from each other if there is nothing that they share. So when two objects differ, they are the same in one way and other in another way. And, in when, two, and when two objects are other from each other, they are different in every way, not just in some respects. And then finally, this leads us to a principle, which is the transitivity of sameness. If X is the same as Y, and Y is the same as Z, then X is the same as Z. And this is how Suarez ends his treatise on the various kinds of distinction. I hope you learned something.